Now we turn to Nick Schifrin, who picks up our reporting on the global food crisis. And for more on the challenges not only in South Sudan, but all of East Africa, and a larger look at some of the issues coming out of the Ukraine war, I'm joined by the executive director of the World Food Program, David Beasley. David Beasley, welcome back to the News Hour. Thank you very much. Uh, we just heard in that story uh, that WFP has less than half of the money it needs in South Sudan. Uh, and Fred reported that some people will actually go hungry at the end of the month uh, if that money doesn't come in. How acute is that problem? It's a very serious problem. And it's a very serious problem all over the world, Nick. And, and we're facing an unprecedented food crisis globally. South Sudan is no exception to the rule right now. You know, the Republicans and Democrats have been fighting over everything, agreeing on nothing. But they did just come together. A miracle on Pennsylvania Avenue. They came up with an additional $5 billion for food security around the world. That's going to have a major, major impact. And we got to get more nations to step up because, as you're saying, South Sudan, we don't have enough money. The U.S. can't do it alone. The other countries need to step up, particularly the Gulf states with all prices being so high, their net profits increase in billions of dollars per week. There's no reason, no reason at all, especially the Gulf states to step up in countries in their region like Somalia and Ethiopia, and Syria and Yemen, places like that. And so let's look at the larger question of East Africa. The UN says as many as 37 million people across seven countries uh, from Djibouti to Uganda are expected to face acute food security this year. You were recently in Somalia. Uh, where we have seen a 260% increase in children under five with severe malnutrition. When you look at the regional challenge, uh, how overwhelming does it seem? It's heartbreaking. You, you can't believe this has happened in, in 2022. And here we are with, you know, you just came out of, you've got conflict, you have climate shocks, you have COVID economic ripple effect. Then you've got oil prices, lack of fertilizer, and the Ukrainian crisis just on top of everything. It's like a tsunami on top of a tsunami. I was just in, literally the last few days, in the drought-stricken areas of Somalia, as well as northern uh, Kenya, and as well as Ethiopia. In many of these places, Nick, their livelihood is 100% livestock, and their livestock are dying by the millions as we speak. And I literally was talking to mothers and fathers who are just heartbroken. They have no money, they have no hope. I said, what happens if the World Food Program is not there? If we don't come in with relief? And, and mother after mother said, we'll start dying like the animals. And Nick, if we don't come in, it's not just that people will die. You'll have destabilization, radicalization, and you'll have mass migration. And, and these alone will cost a thousand times more than coming in in helping people stabilize their lives and giving them some hope at a time like this. We're talking about a failure to get some funding, especially in East Africa, but the International Rescue Committee recently pointed out the appeal for Ukraine was 85% funded. Why do you think there's such a disparity? Yeah, I don't know. I, I know I've been fighting hard to get dollars. A, a, a starving child, I don't care where that child is. We have a moral obligation to reach that child, whether it's in Ukraine or in Somalia or Ethiopia or Guatemala or Afghanistan, because children are children. If we don't reach them, you know, they, if they don't die, they'll be radicalized or they'll have limitations because of health restrictions, you know, the wasting, the stunting that we're talking about, and the entire country pays a price and the world pays a price for that. So we have an obligation to help children. You know, here, here's what really, really upsets you. When you think about the simple fact there's $430 trillion worth of wealth on the planet today and that any child in the world dies from hunger, it's a disgrace on humanity. Let's zoom into Ukraine. We have seen the brave commander, the first WFP funded ship leave Ukraine for the northern horn of Africa carrying 23,000 tons of wheat. Why is it the only ship so far uh, that has left Ukraine for some of the countries that need it most? Well, there's a lot of issues involved and we're making great progress. I've been saying it's critical to open the port to calm the markets around the world. So it's starting to happen. We've got our first ship of 23,000 metric tons that's moving forward. That will go to the Djibouti port to help feed the people in, in Ethiopia. 
That 23,000 will serve about 1.53 million people over a 30-day period. We've got another ship that'll be 7,000 uh, metric tons, hopefully be moving out next week that'll reach over 2 million people, and that will go to Yemen. And I can tell you, all that food is needed right now immediately and urgently to save lives. Every day matters right now, Nick. Every single day makes a difference in the life of a child who's not getting the food that they need. Many of the ships that have left Ukraine so far uh, were already uh, full of food that had been ordered before the invasion. We're actually sitting there before the Russian invasion. It sounds like what you're saying is that we're about to see more ships leaving for the places that need it most. This is a global crisis. Ukraine plays a very important part. It's a, you know, Russia and Ukraine alone grow 30% of the world's supply of wheat. And when you consider that the droughts that we're facing around the world, you can only imagine the problems that we're going to have in harvesting for the coming year. And then you take the fertilizer crisis on top of that. You've got a, you've got a perfect storm already in 2022. 2023 could even be worse if we don't get ahead of this, Nick. We've got to get ahead of this in a comprehensive way, and Ukraine's a very important part of it. As the U.S. has been very clear, it is not sanctioned uh, any kind of fertilizer or food export from Russia, but the U.S. has sanctioned transportation companies, banks, insurance companies that would do the business uh, of exporting from Russia. So has this deal allowed an increase in the exports from Russia, fertilizer and food? Yeah, Nick, we've all been working on that. There are a lot of nuances in there because we've been talking to the banks, insurers, and the, what happened in the Ukraine opening up the port has really alleviated a lot of that pressure. And I think there are breakthroughs taking place as we speak. It's not an easy process. As you can imagine, banks and transporters, shippers, as well as the insurers, you know, are very cautious about it. Uh, regardless of what's said. And I think the United States State Department has reached out and really tried to alleviate some of those concerns so that we can uh, address this extraordinary perfect storm globally. And it's critical that all fertilizers start moving around the world. David Beasley, Executive Director of the World Food Program. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nate.